Well, as a reminder and encouragement to pastor, there's always pancakes. <laughs> we are thankful for uh, pastor and his wife and his family, and I have to give him a hard time every once in a while because that's a good thing, right? In fact, I'm going to do one more. Um, if you were here last week, this will make sense. If you weren't, that's okay. Listen to it online, but um, I have two different socks on. Last week, Pastor had two different socks on. Now, mine are both black, okay? This is a different checked pattern, but they're both completely black. I don't know what he did last week. I didn't see him, but I heard that his were quite different. Um, I intentionally put mine on different just to make him feel better about himself. So I have two different socks on. They are both black, and if you want to examine them, uh, you're more than welcome to. They're black. I'm not going to show them as he didn't show his socks last week either. Well, our series is Hope is Born. And we are walking into the Christmas season. And there is much for us to consider. There is much for us to think about. And it is good for us. As Pastor said, God's word is our food, our spiritual food. Just as you would sit down and enjoy a full course meal. Spiritually, God's word is a full course meal for us. And as we come to it, there is so much truth that brings actual hope. We're not talking about pie in the sky or just wishing. We're talking about concrete things that we can build our lives on. There is so much hope in God's word. So we're thinking about the fact of hope being born in the person of Jesus. And so as I was preparing for this week and as pastor asked me to preach, he said, hey, why don't you take the virgin birth of Christ? And I said, come on, man. Is there another part of the Christmas story I could do? That's a that's a tricky part. It's difficult for us to wrap our minds around. But I want you to know. The virgin birth of Christ is necessary. It is necessary for redemption, and we're going to see that. Pastor gave away the the trick. I was going to ask you where we were going to be, and someone might say, we might be in Matthew 1 or Luke 1, passages that talk about the virgin birth of Christ, but we're actually going to be in Galatians. And so if you can take your Bible, turn to Galatians, we're going to read a few verses in chapter 1 and 3, and then we're going to get to our text in Galatians chapter 1. Four. Again, the theme for the month is hope is born. And it goes without saying that humanity desperately needs hope. Now, this has always been true, has it not? People have always needed hope. But God has worked in such a way, particularly this year. And we have to remember that when God's, God works, it's according to his grace and it's by his grace There are a lot of people, as Pastor said, who are going through real trials and struggles this year. Not necessarily related to 2020 and all that's going on, but just real struggles that many of our church family are walking through. But God is working, and he always works in such a way, and I think he has worked uniquely this year to make us especially aware of our desperation especially aware of our need, especially aware of our need for Christ. And church, there is so much going on in our world today. We really can't stop and just catalog it all right now. I think you all understand there is so much going on and there's so many things that people are saying. There's so many voices. There's so many ideas. There's so many thoughts. There's so many opinions and so many everything. It's difficult to walk through and navigate life. And what hope is there? When things are so mixed up, but church, there's so much going on, but regardless of anything that's going on, regardless of what's going on in our own souls, we have to remember that our hope is in God. Our hope, and I have to say this carefully, but I think as as a church, we need to come together and consider these, these truths. We pray certain ways. And there are things that we would like to see God do, and we we pray that he will do them. But at the end of the day, our hope is not in the political system. Do Do you believe that? There are things that I want to see, but the political system and any law that's made or not made is not humanity's hope. God is our hope. And so we pray certain ways, and we vote certain ways, and we talk to people certain ways. And I encourage you to do that. But as a church, as a body of God's people, our hope is in God. And so we come together, and we look towards him, and we see what he has to say for our desperation. It's not 
whether we do this or do that or what happens or what doesn't happen. Our hope is in God. And God is sovereignly and providentially working to establish his kingdom. Do you believe that that's what he's doing right now? Because he is. No matter what happens, no matter what you see when you open your phone and you see the news or you turn on the TV and you see what's happening in the world, God is actively, sovereignly, and providentially working to bring about his kingdom. And for that, the church can rejoice. There are hard things that will take place before God's kingdom is established and his rule is ruling in peace. We want that. We long for that. But there's difficulties along the way, and we have to remember that our hope is in God, and he is sovereignly and providentially working through all the ups and the downs, through our comforts and our discomforts, to establish his kingdom for his glory so that his people can be with him. And again, the church needs to hope in God. What God is doing now and what he will be doing in the future with his kingdom gives us a tremendous amount of hope. But there is much hope in what God has already done. And so I'd like to rewind the story, so to speak, as we go back to the Christmas story, the birth of Christ, and consider the hope that we have specifically in the virgin birth of Christ. When we come to the virgin birth of Christ, it's easy for us to have one of two opinions. Either one, it's just so supernatural, only somebody who believes in fairy tales would believe something like that would happen. Or the complete opposite of it is we believe that it's true, but it just becomes so complacent to us. It's just, it's just a part of the Christmas story. We don't really stop to think about the fact that the virgin birth is necessary for our redemption. There's so much beauty in that truth, but yet we so often don't spend any time considering it. The main idea, which is in your worship guide, and I would encourage you to open that up and you can follow along, because we are talking about something that's a doctrinal statement. In Galatians, Paul uses a lot of doctrine to make his point, and so I don't, I don't want us to get lost in the weeds. I think following along in your worship guide will be helpful for you, but there is definite and concrete hope in what we're going to see in Scripture, and I think if you have your worship guide open in front of you, it'll just help. So the main idea in the worship guide is this. The virgin birth is more than a historical event and part of the Christmas story. It is those things. It is a historical event, and it is a part of the Christmas story. And so we can rejoice for those things. But more than that, the virgin birth is is the necessary basis for all our hope in this broken world. It's easy for us to think about the hope we have in the death in the resurrection of Christ, as we should consider the death and resurrection of Christ really on a day-by-day basis, what Christ has accomplished to defeat sin and to secure eternal life for us. That is a tremendous thing that every believer should regularly and continually think about. That's, in fact, the essence of the theme, hope is born. We know that in Christ there is the forgiveness of sin, and so we, we worship Christ and we exalt Christ when we consider his birth. But how often? Do we stop and consider the necessity, not just that it happened, but the necessity of the virgin birth, let alone the hope that the virgin birth brings us? I just want to make this exceptionally clear, and then we'll look at Scripture to to see these things. Without the virgin birth, redemption is impossible. I know that's a really heavy and weighty thought. Can that really be true that without the virgin birth, there is no redemption? But that's what we're going to see today. Without the virgin birth, redemption is impossible. Therefore, we need the impossible to occur. Because that's the critique of many people. It's just a legend. It's just a myth. It's impossible. It's supernatural. Have you looked at the world that we live in and how desperate we are? All the things that man has tried to solve our problem and to create hope has always only created more desperation. We need something supernatural. We need the hand and the working of God to do something that we can't do for ourselves. And so, praise God, God works in supernatural ways to redeem us from where we are in our own sin and from the brokenness of the world. No one can argue those facts. And so, that's not proof of the virgin birth but it's proof of the necessity of the virgin birth, that we need a supernatural work of God to break into history. 
into our lives and into the very word of God that informs our belief and our faith that we can have concrete hope in Christ. We're going to open with a word of prayer because I forgot to do that and I think it's necessary. We don't have to pray. Pastors already pray, but I want to, I want to open in prayer. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for this day you've given to us. And this morning, we have the pleasure and the joy of considering something that is so common to us, the virgin birth of your son. And if we're not careful, we can either just dis dismiss it or just pass over it without really grasping the beauty and the weight that you have communicated to us in your word about the necessity of the virgin birth. And so, Lord, I pray that you would open our minds, that our, that, our, that our thinking would be clear, that the Holy Spirit would be teaching and illumining and leading us as we look at your given word, that our hearts would be ready and prepared to receive the truth, that we would have a longing, that in our hearts there would be a burning and a passion because we're talking about the basis of our hope. And so, Lord, may we be energized in our soul as we seek to worship you, as we seek to exalt you. Of the many ways and of the many reasons we have to do that, this is surely a tremendous one. And so open our hearts. May we be receptive to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, here we find ourselves in Galatians. The book of Galatians is a defense of the purity and the power of the gospel of grace. In the very first chapter, I'm not going to read all these verses, but I'm going to give you the chapter and verse. And you can look at them, you can jot them down, and I'll, I'll summarize them for us so that we can move through and get our context quite quickly. In the first chapter, verses 4 and 5, we see that Jesus gave himself to deliver us from our hopelessness. We see in verse 4, who gave himself for our sins. Not his sins, for our sins. We're sinners, we're transgressors, we're rebels, we live in a broken world. But he gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us. That's where we're going. That's what the gospel of grace is all about. The gospel of grace is not if you can make your life better or try harder to do really good things and try really hard not to do bad things, then somehow you can have a good relationship with God. That's not the gospel of grace. The gospel of grace is that Christ has accomplished for us what we cannot accomplish for ourselves. And by grace, we're given new life. That's the gospel of grace, and Paul sets out to defend the purity and the power of the gospel, which is why we see Paul so shocked at how quickly the Galatians were turning away from grace to a different gospel, verses 6 through 9 of chapter 1. He was shocked, verse 6, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. You, you have seen life in Christ, and it's at no cost to you, and you're turning away from that. Now, they weren't converting to some kind of pagan religion. They weren't, they weren't turning into people who just rejected the idea of God. Instead, what they were doing was they were trying to mix Judaism into the gospel. Specifically, they were teaching that requiring obedience to the law was necessary for salvation. If you want to have a right relationship with God, if you want to go to heaven, you have to believe who Jesus is, and then you have to obey the law. Once you've obeyed the law, then... You can have a right relationship with God. And Paul is saying, why are you doing that? That's not the gospel. It's actually the opposite of the gospel. So Paul says very definitively in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, that no one, no one is justified by the law. Try as hard as you want to keep it, but even if you could keep it all, that would not justify your soul. No one is justified by the law, but... You are justified through faith in Christ. Now here we are talking about the hope of Christ. Hope being born. Hope in Christ. But this doesn't mean that the law serves no purpose. In chapter 3, verse 19, and this is where we're going to start to slow down and hone in as we get closer to chapter 4. In chapter 3, verse 19 he asks this question, and the question is really coming from the concept, okay, if no one is justified, if no one is saved, 
by keeping the law, then why do we have law in the first place? It's such a cumbersome burden. So we ask, wherefore then serveth the law? What's its purpose? If it doesn't save us, why do we have it? And so he answers the question. It was added because of transgressions. Basically, the law came. God gave us the law. Number one, to show us his holiness. And two, to show us our sin. Have you ever been around your children or heard other children whenever you're correcting them say something like, well, I didn't know it was wrong. I just didn't know. I didn't know. And we all have heard things like that. And to be honest, sometimes it's just a cop out for, I didn't want to get caught, but I am. And so I didn't know it was wrong. That could be a sentence of rebellion. That happens frequently. But every once in a while, you're working with a young child and you correct them and they say, I didn't know. And they honestly didn't know. That what they said that they heard someone at school say was wrong. And so you tell them, no, that's wrong. And here's why it's wrong. So the law was added to show us our desperation. To show us our sin. To show us our failures. To show us our rebellion. And I know, that is a bleak picture that I'm painting. But that's just the point. That's where we live. And that's why we need the hope of Christ. So the law was added to show us our sin. But then look at the rest of the verse. It says, till... So, the law was given, and it had a purpose. And then it says, till, until, the seed should come. And I want you to just take those words. If you want to underline, underline those words. Till the seed should come. Who is the seed? Let's look up at verse 16. Now, to Abraham and his seed. So, seed is children. Children who are born. Abraham was promised children. Abraham and his wife Sarah could not have children, but God gave them a son. He gave them a seed. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. That's a, that's a tricky verse, but the point is this. The seed that's being talked about here is Christ is Jesus. So, when it says, till the seed should come, we're talking about till there would be a son, a seed, who would come and enter our existence, enter our humanity, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. In other words, when Jesus would come, his relationship to the law would be different than our relationship to the law. We're under the law. And as we're going to see in chapter 4, Christ was born under the law as well, so that he could redeem those under the law. But his relationship to the law was different than ours. The law magnifies our sin. When I look at the law, it shows me my failure. It shows me my transgression. It shows me my need. But you know what the law does for Christ? The, The law shows Christ's righteousness because he fulfilled the law. He kept the law. This is the beginning of the light opening for us to see the hope that there is in Christ. But where does the virgin birth fit into this? Let's just read our verses in chapter 4, verses 3 through 5. And then I have a question for you. Chapter 4, verses 3 through 5 says, Even so we, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. And then verse 4 and 5. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. Why? To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now, let me ask you a question. What does it mean that Jesus was virgin born? I don't need all the details, okay? But what does it mean that Jesus was virgin born? Yes, Mary didn't have any intimate relationship with any man, including Joseph, And that's seen in Matthew and Luke. That's the testimony of Scripture. Yes, it means that Jesus was miraculously conceived by the Holy Spirit within Mary. That's in Matthew and Luke. But more than just those facts, 
What is the purpose of the virgin birth? What is actually accomplished in the virgin birth? And I'm going to say this, and I want you to think about it. You might want to run it down, write it down, because this is really everything in a nutshell. Jesus was physically Mary's son. She had a child. But this son was not Joseph's son physically. I want to say that again. Jesus was physically Mary's son, but he was not Joseph's son physically. That's, that's the miracle of the virgin birth. So when Jesus was born of Mary, he was a man. He had a human nature. He was a man like Adam. But he was not Joseph's son physically, meaning although he was a human and he had a human nature, he did not have a sinful nature. And he was, as Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians, he was a new Adam, a second Adam that would come and that would be a substitute for those who had their own sin that they could be redeemed. So Galatians 4, 4, and 5 doesn't say anything about the virgin birth of Christ explicitly. In fact, I think Paul assumes that the reader understands already about Christ's virgin birth. So he's not defending it. And that's not my goal this morning either. I don't want to defend the virgin birth. Instead, Paul is explaining what the virgin birth accomplishes and why it's necessary. And so that's what I would like to do this morning. There's three points, and it won't take very long to go through. Point number one, that's in the worship guide. The virgin birth gives us hope because, number one, we are desperate and we need a miraculous deliverer. We're desperate, and we need a miraculous deliverer. Just in Galatians, we see, chapter 1, verse 4, we're in bondage to this present evil age. Chapter 3, verse 13, we're under the curse of the law. Galatians 3, 19, we are transgressors. Galatians 4, 3, we're in bondage under the elements of the world. Do you get the theme there? We're in a desperate situation. And these things, they define us. And when we really stop and consider our own hearts and consider what's being said of the Galatians and us, we realize and we can testify to the fact that we know that to be true. These things define us. And more importantly, we can't rescue ourselves. We can't deliver ourselves. Even if we could obey the law, that wouldn't justify us. I want to read to you a quote from a man named Stephen Wellham. Uh, it's a little bit longer than I normally like to read, but he says it very well. So I want to read this. And then we're going to consider more about this miraculous deliverer. In reference to the virgin birth, he writes this. Our Savior and Redeemer is utterly unique. And that begins at the virgin birth of Christ. The virgin conception of Christ, even. Our Savior and Redeemer is utterly unique. He has to be. If we want to be redeemed, if we want to be saved, this rescuer has to be unique. This is why there is no salvation outside of him. He is in a category all by himself in who he is and what he does. In fact, because our plight is so desperate due to sin, the only person who can save us is God's own dear son. It is only as the son incarnate, incarnate means God in the flesh, so God came, humbled himself, took on flesh, he was born in a manger. It is only as the son incarnate that our Lord can represent us. It is only as a son incarnate that he can put away our sin, stand in our place, and turn away God's wrath by bearing our sin. Only Jesus can satisfy God's own righteous requirements because he is one with the Lord as the son of God. And Jesus can do this for us because he is truly a man and can represent us. Now, there's a lot there. There are many who reject the virgin birth of Christ because they believe it's just a Fairy tale, it's a supernatural thing, and that's just a myth. But that's exactly what we need, a supernatural delivery. Pastor Steve and Tom and I are studying the book of Judges right now. He mentioned a study on Wednesday in Gideon. The, the book of Judges is about uh, the deliverers that God gave to Israel. Ehud, Gideon, Samson, you know all those stories. Well, whenever you consider the book of Judges, these judges, these people were sent by God to deliver his people. His people were in desperate situations, and so God sent deliverers to rescue his people. But every single one of these deliverances were only temporary. In fact, there's a cycle to the book of Judges. 
The people sin and they worship idols and so God judges them. And then they cry out to God Then God sends a deliverer. And so everything's good and merry, right? No, they turn and worship idols. God judges them. God sends a deliverer. Then guess what? They sin again. That's the cycle of humanity, the desperation of our need. Now, these judges, because of God's grace and because of God's power, did some miraculous things. Consider Samson killing a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. That's miraculous. God did a miraculous thing through Samson. But all of these deliverers were moral failures, weren't they? When you really stop and look at their lives, they were sinners themselves. And we get frustrated reading the the judges. Samson, God's given you an ability to stand up and to rescue your people. Why don't you just obey God? Why don't you love him? Why don't you follow him? And yet his heart is so quickly turned. And that is such a picture of our own need and our own desperation. But Jesus is a miraculous deliverer because he was of many things, but first, uniquely virgin-born. So, the virgin birth gives us hope because we are desperate and we need a miraculous deliverer. Number two, the virgin birth gives us hope because all of history and the redemptive story anticipates the God-man Jesus. Now, there's no time to walk through all of human history right now. And there is no time to walk through the entire redemptive story right now. We would have to start in Genesis and go all the way to Revelation. But look at Galatians 4.4. And this phrase, if I could encourage you, here's your application for the day, okay? Go home, write this down, underline it, and I want you to think about it for the next month. As you anticipate the birth of Christ, and you go through the month of December... And you're thinking more and more and more about God coming to earth, dying for our sin. Take this phrase and think about it because it is inexhaustible. It is inexhaustible. It says this, but when the fullness of time was come. Take that, write that down. And any time you read your Bible or hear anything about human history, put that phrase front and center in your mind. Because everything in human history and everything in the redemptive story of the Bible is working itself to an apex. And that apex is Christ. Let me give you an illustration. A few days ago, Caden was helping me put up some Christmas lights. Jim Winders gave us a whole bunch of Christmas lights a couple years ago. And I was so thankful because I didn't want to go out and buy them. And he wasn't using them anymore. So I said, yeah, I could use some Christmas lights. So we were putting up Christmas lights. And I didn't do it last year. Uh, And the kids were still pretty young. And so I said, I'm going to do it this year. I had a whole bunch of other stuff to do. But I'm going to do it. I'm going to get these Christmas lights up because the weather was good. You know what I mean? So we're out there, and he's helping me. And and then the girls come home from school, and they they can see the lights. And they were super excited. I mean, Karis was like a wild banshee. She's running and screaming like a crazy lady. But she was excited because, because the Christmas lights were going up. There was an anticipation. There was something exciting that was happening. Now, the lights were on. But there was only a few strands up because Caden went to get the girls with Heidi and I was waiting for him to come back so I didn't fall off the roof and die. So I was waiting. Some of the lights were up. They were lit. But there was an anticipation of seeing everything at night. And so Caden and I continued to work. There's the fullness of time progressing. We're working. We're putting up the lights. And as we're doing that, it's getting darker. And when it got dark, just as we finished, the fullness of time had come. So what did he do? He goes and runs into the house. Girls, come out. You have to see the Christmas lights. They're all up. The fullness of time had come. And they come out with excitement and joy because the anticipation is not needed anymore because the reality is there. This is the same essence of this phrase, yet concerning Christ. Take your Bible and go quickly to Genesis chapter 3. I want to show you briefly about this fullness of time and what that means in respect to our Bible reading and understanding the redemptive story of God. Genesis chapter 3, we know the story. God made everything by the power of his word. God made Adam and Eve for a relationship to have with him, for fellowship. And yet Adam and Eve turned in their pride and turned and rebelled against God, and we would expect God to be super angry and just destroy them because that's what they deserve. That's what was just. But God comes in mercy, 
to his fallen creation. And he talks to them. And in the middle of his talking to them, all the way back in the beginning of our Bible, God makes a promise of deliverance. In the very beginning of Scripture, after the fall, God makes a promise of deliverance. In talking to Adam and Eve and talking about what this broken world is going to look like, he says in verse 15, And I will put enmity between, between thee and the woman, he's talking to the serpent, and between thy seed. Remember that word from Galatians? God's going to put enmity between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head. Her seed, her descendant, her child will crush your head, serpent. You will bruise his heel, but in your bruising of his heel, he will crush you. That's the promise of hope that God gave from the very beginning of time. Now, just take your Bible and go to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. This is a normal conception. The first conception. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived. And bare Cain. And said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Didn't God promise that there would be a child? Didn't God promise that there would be a seed? Not only was there Cain, verse 2, and she bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. You know, some guys don't handle childbirth very well. Okay, I don't know how you did. If you uh, have children and maybe you were a part of that process, maybe you handled it well, maybe you didn't handle it very well. Think about Adam. I mean, seriously. This is all happening for the first time. Like, uh, Eve, I don't know how to help you here. This is going crazy. Like, maybe he passed out. Uh, Maybe God put him to sleep again. I have no idea. But this is happening for the first time. What is the expectation that they have based on the promise of God? When will this deliverer come? Is it the first son? Is it the second son? Was it Cain? No, it wasn't Cain. He didn't crush the serpent. He crushed his brother. Right? He wasn't the deliverer. Well, of course, it wasn't Abel, but think about Abel for a minute. Was it, was it Abel? No. He was innocent, but he was crushed. Think about a picture of anticipation there. The whole story of the Bible is anticipating a Redeemer, a Savior who is born uniquely different than these sons. And even if we take our Bible one more page and go to Genesis chapter 5, one of the most Awkward chapters of Genesis. We see this genealogy of people who begat someone. Look at verse 3. And Adam lived 130 years and begat. He had a son. Is this the one that's promised? No, because he died. Verse 6. And Seth lived 100 years and begat Enos. Is is he the promised one? No, he died. And chapter 5 is all about there were children born, but they died. Born, then they died. None of them were the promised seed, the promised Redeemer. And then we get to Genesis chapter 6, where we see that humanity is not fixing its desperation. In fact, humanity is making its desperation worse. Again, the need that we have as believers. The anticipated son that the Bible is referring to in Genesis 3 is a son that must be different. He must be God and he must be man. That's the only way redemption can be accomplished. Even the law anticipated this back in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 19, that phrase, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Even the law was anticipating one who would come and fulfill it. We don't need a law to be right with God. We need a promise. And Christ brought the promise to us as he fulfilled the law in our place. So the virgin birth gives us hope because all of history in the redemptive story anticipates the God-man, Jesus. And then, number three, redemption and sonship is only possible through the virgin birth. As we read these verses again with that truth stated and with this in mind, 
I want you to see the purpose clauses that are in the verse. It says, verse 4, But when the fullness of time was come, when the time was just right, when everything was planned and prepared for redemption to take place, God sent forth his Son. So that's a statement of his deity. He is God in the flesh, God incarnate. He's sent from the Father, made of a woman. That's his taking on a flesh, being born of a virgin, made under the law. That's what he came into. Then verse 5, we have our purposes. Two, to do what? To be super awesome? He was, but there was a more specific purpose. To redeem them that were under the law. And then another purpose, that, that we, so that we might receive the adoption of sons. In Galatians 3.13, we find that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by being made a curse for us. And this really is the hope of the gospel, that the sinless one came and took our sin and our unrighteousness so that his righteousness could be given to us by promise and not by working for it. And so therefore, the virgin birth of Christ is necessary and it gives us hope. Without it, there would be no redeemer to die for us. In order for the substitutionary atonement of our sin to occur, Jesus had to be God and he had to be man. And that could only happen through the virgin birth. As you, as you walk away today, I know that doctrine can be thick, and it can be weighty, and it can be heavy. But what we've seen here is Paul taking the truth of the virgin birth and the incarnation of Christ, and he's looking back through all of the Bible history, and he's saying everything, just as we saw in Sunday school, everything is pointing forward and anticipating the coming of the one who would be a deliverer for us because we can't deliver ourselves. So as you're reading your Bible this Christmas, as you're reading your Bible throughout the year, no matter where you are, in Genesis, in Leviticus, and in, in the law, no matter where you are, always remember that there is a building up. There is a fullness of time that is growing and leading and pushing our eyes to the coming promised unique one who would make full redemption for our sins. He wouldn't be like a bull that's continually offered over and over and over, he would make complete redemption for his people. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for your word. In one way, I guess it would be sufficient for us just to stand here and say, our hope is in God, and we worship him, and so let's go back to what we deem as worthy for our week. Go back to our jobs, go back to our hobbies, go back to our play, go back to our families. But Lord, we need to stop and at least consider what you've given to us in your word. Paul so clearly gives us the necessity of the incarnation and the virgin birth of Christ. It is the foundation for our hope. So this Christmas season, I pray that we would, as we consider hope being born, that we would remember the uniqueness of this birth, the fulfillment of promises in this birth, that we would remember in a right way who we really are as desperate, needy sinners. We need a deliverer. We need a unique deliverer, a supernatural deliverer who would come and take our place, who would come under the law where we are and fulfill it for us so that we could receive the promise of hope. Lord, may our hearts be full this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.